Welcome to the, this afternoon's collection of actually two lectures in mathematics education. My name is Cheryl Prager. I, uh, I used to be Vice President of the International Commission for Mathematics Instruction. Um, that finished a little while ago, but I ha have an absolute pleasure in being the, the chair of this afternoon's lectures. Our, our first lecture this afternoon is by Professor Lewis Radford. Lewis is an eminent mathematics educator and he is a recipient from ICMI, the International Commission for Mathematics Education, of the 2011 Freudenthal Medal. Lewis comes originally from Guatemala. He completed his doctorate in France and he is currently full professor of mathematics education at the Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. Lewis's research interests include the development of algebraic thinking, the relationship between culture and thought, the epistemology of mathematics and semiotics. He is currently working on the development of a cultural historical theory of teaching and learning and the theory of objectification. Quoting from the citation for the Freudenthal Medal, the impact of Lewis Radford's program of research has been felt especially by the community of research in algebra, teaching and learning, where his theoretical and empirical work has led to significant new insights in this domain, and more broadly by the entire community of mathematics education research with his development of a groundbreaking, widely applicable theory of learning. I am very much looking forward to Lewis's lecture today and I invite him to speak to us on the theories in mathematics education and their conceptual differences. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to start by uh, acknowledging uh, the honor uh, that the invitation to speak this afternoon uh, represents to me. I am very, very happy to be here in Rio. It's not my first time in Brazil, but it's my first time in Rio. Um, yeah. um, let me start my talk by recalling that um, in each historical period, from Mesopotamia, to Egypt, to Alexandria, to Baghdad, to Renaissance Florence, until today, each new generation of uh, individuals has always learned mathematics from its elders. In each historical period, scribes, masters, professors of mathematics have always had to cope with uh, the problem of teaching and learning. However, the teaching and learning of mathematics has been a problem of explicit research for only a bit more than 100 years. Is 100 years a little or a lot? Perhaps it doesn't matter. What matters is that in these 100 years, mathematics education as a research field has evolved and uh, that, uh, that we can distinguish important moments in this uh, evolution. My talk is about theories in mathematics education. Theories didn't appear in the beginning. The emergence of mathematics education theories is part of the evolution of this research field. In this talk, I don't want to make a formal and technical presentation of some theories in mathematics education. You can find such a technical presentation in the proceedings. Instead of making a technical presentation, I believe that it might be more productive if I were to present a few theories in the context of the historical evolution of the field. To this end, I have organized my talk as follows. I will distinguish three moments in the evolution of, of um, mathematics education. The first moment is the, the emergence of the research field around 1900. The second moment is the period from around 1950 to 2000. And the third moment is today. Today is about what has been, uh, has been happening since more or less uh, the year 2000. It is in the second and third moment that theories emerged. Theories 
being understood as systematic approaches, having clear theoretical principles and a methodology to investigate the problems of teaching and learning uh, of mathematics. Of course, other things have happened since the 1950s. But I think that something that marks this span of time in a particular manner is precisely the, the emergence of theories in our field. So, in order to understand theories in mathematics education, let's start with the first moment. Mathematics educators usually agree that the emergence of the mathematics uh, of the field is related to two major events. First is the foundation of the, of the journal L'Enseignement Mathematique in 1899 and the creation of the International Commission on Mathematical Instruction in 1908. By the way, the commission was created during the fourth International Congress of Mathematicians, which was held in Rome in 1908. Since their inception, the journal and the International Commission created an important space for the exchange of ideas about the teaching and learning of mathematics. What was it that led to the foundation of the journal and the creation of the International Commission? What was it that led mathematicians of such caliber, such as Felix Klein, Henri Poincaré, Gaston Darbou, to become interested in the teaching of mathematics? To answer this question, we have to bear in mind that at the, that the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century was an important historical moment in the economic history of Europe, North America, and other parts of the world. Indeed, Europe and these parts of the world were transitioning to what was called a modern civilization. In the eyes of the individuals of uh, that historical period, what made their period modern was precisely its new form of production, namely industrial production. There was a, a clear awareness that such a modern world could only be built with the help of mathematics. It is precisely this idea that was expressed by the well-known French mathematician Emile Borel at the International Conference on Mathematics Instruction held in, in Paris in 1914, Borel said, without the principles of mechanics, analytic geometry, and differential calculus, nothing of what constitutes modern civilization would exist. Now, the creation of an industrial society required a different education for the new generations, an education no longer centered around classical studies, but focused on technology, science, and mathematics. So there was a need to redefine the goals of the teaching of mathematics. At the dawn of the 20th century, not all mathematicians were in agreement with the role that mathematics should come to play in the new social order. We can distinguish two camps. The first camp can be called the socialist camp. And the second one can be called the humanist camp. Let me say a few words uh, about each one of those. The socialist camp saw in mathematics a powerful instrument to change the world, to create the modern society and make industrialization happen. This camp stressed the applicability of mathematics. Among its promoters, we find Emile Borel and Carlo Bourlet, a graduate of uh, the prestigious Ecole Normale Supérieure and one of the main leaders of the 1902 reform in France. In an article published in L'Enseignement Mathematique in 1910, Borel contended that we can no longer afford to present mathematical science to our students in its purely speculative aspects. We must endeavor, no matter what, more as a favor to society than as a favor to our students to bend mathematical abstractions to the necessities of, so of social reality. The humanist camp, by contrast, emphasized the role that mathematics plays in the, uh, in the development of logical thinking, abstraction, and rigor. 
A representative of the humanistic camp was the mathematician uh, Giuseppe Veronesi, who argued that mathematics should help to cultivate the spirit and must help to save education from the utilitarian turn it was taking. Veronese argued that if industrialism or utilitarianism has had preponderant influences in the teaching of middle schools, mathematicians should fight them. So as we can see, for the socialists, it was urgent to move the teaching of mathematics away from a speculative representation of the discipline. For the humanists, mathematics should be oriented toward the cultivation of rigor and logical thinking. What history shows is that bit by bit, the different countries engaged in the industrialization process made more room for the teaching of mathematics. But making more room for mathematics was not enough. Mathematicians also had to deal with the question of how to teach mathematics and what to teach. To give you an idea of the discussions around the organization of the mathematical content, let me mention a debate surrounding the teaching of geometry. Some mathematicians broke with the Euclidean tradition and started presenting 3D and 2D geometry in an uh, integrated manner. And this is the case of the Italian mathematician uh, Luigi Cremona. Cremona says, I alternate without distinction the theorems, the theorems of plane geometry with those of solid geometry, since this sharpens the intellect and help the development of that geometric imagination that is an essential quality to the engineer, so that he can think of the figures in space even without the aid of a design or a model. But not all mathematicians were in agreement with this new presentation. There were oppositions based on pedagogical reasons. And this is the, ca the case of Jacques Adamar. He said, the merging of plane and solid geometry may be something preferable from a logical point of view. But it seems to me that um, pedagogically, we must first think of dividing difficulties. Seeing in space is a serious problem in itself, which I do not consider should be added, first of all, to the other problems of plane geometry. Although there was a consensus about the experimental approach in the introduction to geometry, the articulation with the deductive approach was an object of debate. And the debate went beyond the teaching of mathematics and covered the epistemology of mathematics itself. It was cast in terms of the role of intuition and rigor. In 1901, in a lecture course, Felix Klein stre uh, stressed the role of intuition as follows. He said, a rigorous, a rigorous proof in abstract geometry can never be based only on intuition. It must be founded on logical deduction. Nevertheless, intuition cannot be substituted by logical considerations. Intuition helps us to construct a proof and to gain an overview. It is, moreover, a, so a source of inventions and new mental connections. How then to teach mathematics? The Spanish mathematician Soel Garcia de Saldano argued that the human mind is constituted in such a way that uh, sensible intuition is followed by rational intuition. The preponderance of memory is followed by reason. And based on this epistemological empiricist premise, his, his pedagogical suggestion was that uh, teaching processes must follow this progression. So to recap, so far I have tried to give you a short overview of the first moment in the development of mathematics uh, education 
as a field of research. The first moment revolved mainly around the goal of the, of the teaching of mathematics, what to teach and how to teach it. There was a tension that, result, that resulted from two views of teaching, an experimental approach and a, and a deductive approach, and their articulation. This tension led to uh, question, uh, the question of the epistemological value of the senses and the role of intuition in mathematical knowledge. Tension that was overcome through the, do, the dubious assumption of an unproblematic transition between sensible intuition and the, the deductive reason. Let's uh, move to the second moment in the evolution of um, uh, mathematics education. Mathematics education continued to evolve during the first half of the 20th century with interruptions that resulted from the world wars. And a turning point in, in the evolution of our discipline was the creation in 1968 of the journal Educational Studies in Mathematics by mathematician Hans Freudenthal. Freudenthal's book, Mathematics as uh, an, a, a, an Educational Task, published in 1973, shows traces of the tension between the deductive approaches and experiential approaches uh, to the teaching of mathematics that were, as we just saw, at the heart of the debates of the first moment. But in Freudenthal's work, the tension takes a different turn. It is somehow, somehow overcome in the, in, in the elaboration of an approach to teaching and learning that claims two things. First, the active role of the student. And second, attention to the needs and interests of the student. Of course, the student's needs and interests were always in the mind of the pro protagonists of the first moment. But in the second moment of the evolution of math education, the student is brought to the fore with unprecedented force. Three passages from the literature of the time may help to illustrate this point. In the first one, its author, Paul Rosenblum, criticizes a number of approaches to the teaching of vectors, qualifying them as unsatisfactory. The reason being that uh, often the authors give no natural and non-trivial problems which lead the student to feel a need for uh, vector concepts. A number of these presentations seem overly abstract. So you see here, the, the, the failure of those uh, uh, methods is that they don't consider the student. My second example comes from uh, Freudenthal's book mentioned before. Freudenthal, Freudenthal says that instead of being shown the mathematical proofs by the teacher, the pupil himself should reinvent mathematics. And he goes on to say that uh, the stress is shift from teaching to learning, from the teacher's actions to the pupils. The pupil must perform the mathematical action. As mentioned previously, in the first moment, a central question was the organization of the mathematical curriculum. It was tacitly assumed that a proper scientific organization of the content was, at least to a great extent, sufficient to ensure learning. In the second moment, this assumption is no longer considered to be enough. It is necessary to rethink teaching and to come with, up with new pedagogical methods. And my third example shows this point clearly. It comes from a 1969 article dealing with um, a pedagogical method that is described in, 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 the, in the paper. The author says, this method forces the student to work and discover the results himself in, instead of attending a boring class. What happened? How is it that the student is no longer considered a receiver of mathematical knowledge and that instead the student is supposed 
to reinvent mathematics on her own. Like in the first moment of the evolution of mathematics education, in the second moment, there are societal reasons that make mathematics education take, the, take takes this turn or that turn. In this case, the reasons are linked to what I want to, uh, to call here the invention of the child. I, I am not keen, but don't get, get me wrong. I think that we all agree that education has always been about educating people, and in particular children. Yet, the concept of the child at the period, a period that we are discussing now changed profoundly. In the first moment of the evolution of mathematics education, the child was there. Her role was to enter into a, a practice, the practice of mathematics that has been laid down by the teacher in front of her. The child was expected to obediently practice the mathematics that the curriculum offered her. Now, in the second moment in the evolution of mathematics education, the things go the other way around. The child is pictured as actively involved in doing mathematics in accordance with her own needs and motivations. As a result, the question is not just to, to make sure that a mathematical knowledge be presented in, uh, in a way that is accessible to the student's intellectual force, to use the Galdiano's word, words uh, in uh, 1899. The question is now to make sure that the teaching of mathematics takes into account the child's needs and motivations, and that learning emanates from the child from her own actions and deeds. This is quite a shift in the manner of thinking about the teaching and learning of mathematics. But what was it that made this shift possible? How did a child come to occupy the driver's seat? The shift is, uh, the, is the result of a long process in the conceptualization of the individual in Western culture and the child in particular. In mathematics, we say that uh, a result follows from theorems proved by X or Y. Here, the result follows from Kant's philosophy, Piaget's epistemology, and principles, and principles of political economy. I don't have time to go into the details. What is important to bear in mind is that the focus shift from problems about the organization of the mathematical content to the problem of outlining a pedagogy whose focus would be the child. Such a pedagogy is what came to be known as child-centered pedagogy. It was conceived of and defined as the opposite of transmission pedagogy, where the teacher lectures and the student passively listens to the teacher. The paradigmatic research question was to understand how the child thinks mathematically, or if you prefer, the question was to understand the child's mathematical thinking. It shouldn't come as a surprise that it is at this moment in the evolution of the teaching and learning of mathematics, that is around 1950s, uh, that, that um, psychology came to play a big influence in mathematics education. And it is at this juncture that the first theories in mathematics education emerged. The first one I want to mention here uh, was developed in the United States and is known as uh, constructivism. Constructivism in mathematics education means something different from the meaning it has in mathematics. It is a child-centered learning theory that posits the goal of mathematics education as a psychological problem. At the end of the 1980s, one of its proponents argued that two general goals of mathematical instruction that follow from constructivism are the construction of increasingly powerful mental conceptual structures and that, and this is very important, the development of intellectual autonomy. These are the reasons we should be teaching, according to constructivism, uh, mathematics to children. 
Constructivism is based on some theoretical principles. The first one is that knowledge is not passively received, but built up by the cognizing subject. And the second principle says that uh, the function of cognition is adaptive and serves the organization of the experiential world, not the discovery of ontological reality. Principle one stresses constructivism's opposition to teaching by transmission. It also stresses the idea that each individual, each student constructs her own knowledge. Principle two adds further information about the constructivist concept of knowledge without necessarily denying the, exist the existence of a pre-existing reality and in a move consistent with Kant's theory of knowledge, constructivism doesn't claim that the knowledge constructed by the cognizing subject corresponds to, to such a reality. Its ontology is rather neutral. The constructivist and neutral ontology is not a, a mere extravagant uh, theoretical position. It is rather one of the consequences of the remarkable subjectivism or individualism in which it was rooted from the start. You, and only you, can construct your knowledge. And there is no way to assert whether or not it coincides with objective reality, if such a thing exists. How does constructivism translate, translate into practice? Through the creation of classroom conditions for the development of mental conceptual structures. This point leads unavoidably to question the role of the teacher in constructivism. The teacher's role is not merely to convey uh, to students information about mathematics. One of the teacher's primary responsibilities is to facilitate profound cognitive uh, restructuring and conceptual reorganizations. To understand the role of the teacher in this theory, we have to take into account the fact that its epistemic and ontological principles, one and two, that I just mentioned, make sense only in the context, in the context of a student that is autonomously constructing her knowledge. There is a third constructivist principle, a principle of a pedagogical nature, that guides teaching and learning constructivist settings. The principle can be formulated as follows. The cognizing subject not only constructs her own knowledge, but she must do so in an autonomous way. The construction of knowledge must be a personal affair. The practical question for constructivism is hence to devise pedagogical actions coherent with the idea of avoiding teaching the answers and influencing the student's reasoning. In short, the question is how to make sure that the student learns without being told. Here is an example. In this introductory uh, uh, lesson to algebra in a great class uh, of nine to 10 year old students, the teacher invited the, 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 the students to work on the sequence shown in this, uh, this slide. So the first term is three, five, seven, and so on. Yeah? The, the students had to calculate term 10 of this sequence. Now, instead of resorting to an algebraic strategy, the students came up with an arithmetic strategy, doubling, doubling term five. So this is term five. Um, so to, in order to find uh, how, uh, the, the value of term 10, they just double and remove one of the bingo chips there. The idea is not bad, but it is a bit unpractical to calculate terms like uh, 103, for instance. Now, the teacher's didactical project was completely different. It was rather to bring the students to notice a variational relation between the number of the term and the red bingo chips. So it could go like this. But what to do there? What can the teacher do since in accordance with the third principle of constructivism, the student has to construct knowledge autonomously? Any hint from the teacher 
would be an attempt to destroy the autonomy project. To show how this principle is anchored in the pedagogic movement of the second movement, of the second moment in the evolution of theories in mathematics education, let me recall uh, Freudenthal's uh, claim. He said, betraying a secret that could be discovered by the child itself is bad pedagogics. It's even a crime. But what if the child cannot discover it? The task is even more difficult when the teaching of mathematics involves more advanced concepts than those of primary school mathematics. It is difficult to expect, indeed, that the students construct by themselves the concept of real numbers, as Cauchy or Dedekind did. Constructivism has been criticized by sociocultural approaches for failing to take in consideration the role of history and culture in its account of learning. It has also been criticized for its, uh, its individualist view of learning and the little room that it makes for the teacher in the learning of the students. All in all, constructivism as a theory of, learn, of learning moved mathematics education to a new era. It offered new possibilities for asking deep questions. For instance, what is the, child's, the children's conception of probability, or number, and so on. It also offered a sophisticated method for conducting longitudinal analysis of classroom video recording, recordings and transcripts. It has helped the community of mathematics educators become aware of the variety of meanings that the students mobilize in tackling mathematical problems. I turn now to the second theory that I want to mention here. It is a theory that emerged in the 70s and 80s. It's uh, the, the, the theory of uh, didactical situations, TDS. Um, this French theory um, is uh, opposed to direct teaching, like constructivism. And this pedagogical position bring, brings both theories close together. Both constructivism and the TDS stress the active role that the students have to play in learning. Another point of similarity between constructivism and the TDS is their idea of learning. Indeed, one of the principles of um, the TDS that we can call principle one is the following. In accordance with Piaget's genetic epistemology, learning is a form of cognitive adaptation to the environment. However, both theories part ways in, important, in other important points. For one thing, their concept of knowledge is not the same. For constructivism, Knowledge is a subjective psychological construct. Knowledge amounts to the ideas that the student creates or constructs. For the TDS, knowledge is the mathematical knowledge recognized by the community of, of mathematicians. How can the TDS handle the idea that the students, through their active role, will construct the sophisticated knowledge of uh, the, uh, the mathematician, a knowledge that to reach its current state has been refined by hundreds of genera generations of mathematicians. Freudenthal, by the way, suggested the idea of uh, reinvention. And since a pure reinvention in the hands of the students is unlikely to happen, he qualified it as guided re, uh, reinvention. But the TDS doesn't use this term. What it does is assume a delicate principle about the nature of mathematical knowledge. And the principle can be stated as follows. Knowledge appears as the optimal solution to a certain situation or problem. What is delicate here is the required condition of optimality. I shall return to this point in a moment. 
So having adopted this principle, the TDS turns now to the teacher. One of the roles of the teacher is precisely to find good problems or situations to provoke specific students' adaptations. As uh, Guy Brousseau, the creator of this theory, notes, the modern conception of teaching requires the teacher to teach to provoke the expected adaptation of his students by a judicious choice of problems that she puts before them. These problems chosen in such a way that students can accept them must make that student act, speak, think, and evolve by their own motivation. To ensure logic, logical coherence, the theory advances here another epistemological principle, a principle of existence, we could say. For every piece of mathematical knowledge, there is a family of situations to give it an appropriate meaning. And this family is called a fundamental situation. The concrete design of a fundamental situation is a very difficult problem in itself. But is the design of an appropriate fundamental situation enough? Well, for the mathematician who evidently knows how to see situations with mathematical eyes, the answer is yes. But for the student, maybe not. Remember my example uh, uh, before. So the theory introduces a new concept here uh, to specify further the environment in which adaptation should occur. And the name of this concept is the milieu, which is defined uh, as the objects, physical, cultural, social, hum human, with which the subject interacts in a, situ in, in a situation. Example the sheet of paper, the ruler and compass, generate the mil milieu of the Euclidean plane geometry. And Rousseau says, the student learns by adapting herself to a milieu, but a milieu without a didactical intention is manifestly insufficient to induce in the student all the cultural knowledge the, that we wish her to acquire. The milieu becomes thereby something that teachers can design and may control in order to ensure knowledge attainment. Contemporary sociocultural theories in mathematics education contest the aforementioned principles, as they assume that human cognition is invariable across cultures and time. For one thing, the concept of optimal solution may vary from culture to culture. At any rate, such a concept doesn't seem enough to characterize cognition in general and mathematical cognition in particular. There is more to mathematics than questions of economy in thinking, such as beauty and elegance, for instance. Contemporary social cultural theories in mathematics education also contest the view that learning is a form of adaptation. We social cultural theorists go into a different direction and prefer to see Bab Babylonian, Egyptian, Greek, Amazonian, and other mathematics in a less rationalistic way. We prefer to see mathematics as embedded in its own cultural historical contexts and rationalities. We prefer to see mathematics as moved by drives other than those that underpin the search for optimal solutions regardless of what optimal may mean. Anyway, let me continue and turn back to, uh, to the con uh, con uh, concept of milieu. We can ask the question, is choosing the appropriate fundamental situation and milieu enough? Maybe not. If we agree that there may be many ways in which to see a problem or a situation, maybe not. What to do then? To infuse the didactical intention into the situation. What about bringing in the teacher? Oh, perhaps the idea is good, 
but unfortunately, the TDS doesn't make much room for bringing the teacher in during the crucial phase where the student is expected to be learning, to be constructing knowledge. Indeed, a fourth principle specifies further uh, the, con the concept of learning in this theory. The student's autonomy is a necessary condition for the genuine learning of mathematics. Thus, if the process of learning is not accomplished autonomously vis-a-vis -vis the teacher, we cannot assert that learning has happened. Like constructivism in the TDS, a condition for learning is the autonomy of the learner. To sum up, the TDS has had a significant influence in mathematics education, not only in the Francophone world. I was uh, very surprised to see, for instance, that it, had a trem it has tremendous influence in Chile and other parts of South America, here in Brazil too. The detailed epistemic analysis of fundamental situations have helped mathematics educators understand the key role of suitable problems in the teaching and learning of mathematics. Not a any problem will do. To finish my talk, I want to mention briefly some uh, ideas underpinning new sociocultural theories in mathematics education, whose um, emergence can be located somewhere at the end of the last century and beginning of this century constituted in the, in the terminology that I have used here, the, the third moment in uh, the evolution of mathematics education. There are other things going on too, it's not just about theories. Some of these theories move away from the idea of autonomy as a prerequisite of learning. In theories inspired by Russian psychologist Lev Vygotsky, Autonomy is not a prerequisite, but the result of learning. Concerning knowledge, and in contrast, in contrast to constructivism, some contemporary sociocultural theories do not conceive of knowledge as something that the learner constructs. Knowledge at school, at the university, is a cultural historical entity that is there in our culture our mo at the moment of our birth. We need, hence, to resort to other metaphors different from the one of uh, construction to provide accounts of learning. Furthermore, in sociocultural approaches, mathematical knowledge is not considered to be independent of the culture where it is produced and reproduced. Concepts of number are not necessarily the same in all cultures, as research in anthropology makes it clear. In sociocultural theories, we try to overcome the antagonism between the teacher and the student that results from the autonomy project that characterizes the second moment in the evolution of mathematics education. In a theory that I have been articulated, articulating with some collaborators and students, we do think that uh, there may be genuine learning even if the student doesn't solve the problem by herself. We have to overcome the, this uh, the dichotomy or that consists of uh, choosing between the student who constructs knowledge or the teacher who teaches the student. We have to overcome this dichotomy. <laughs> we talk about teachers and students working together in processes through which the students encounter, not construct, they encounter in a critical manner and through meaningful, aesthetic, collective experiences a cultural and historically constituted knowledge, which may be the 
the Western mathematical knowledge, but it may be another kind of knowledge in, in, in another community. So let me uh, make a short synthesis, synthesis of my talk. I try to present you uh, two of the most influential theories in mathematics education, constructivism and the, and the TDS. I presented them briefly within the evolution of our research field. These theories emerged in the 1970s and 80s as a, a response to lecturing teaching and brought to the fore the student as an active agent in learning. The pedagogy that they propose is shaped by assumptions they make about the roles of the learner and the teacher. The meaning of learning and the nature of mathematical knowledge. Emergent sociocultural theories are offering new possibilities to rethink this, these assumptions and to come up with a more social conception of learning where autonomy is replaced by profound forms of collaboration and engagement. The reconceptualization of the teacher and the theoretical characteristics of the various forms of classroom collaboration and the design of mathematical tasks that could be conducive to math learning this is still an open problem. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Lewis, for uh -huh. a really superb and rich exposition of the development of mathematical, the theory of mathematics learning over the last okay. century. Okay. We have a, just a few minutes in case you would like to ask a couple of questions. I'll bring the microphone. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, do you think that the structure of math curriculum towards the real application of constructivism or TDS some possible? If I, th if I think that one. The, the math, the structure of math curriculum. The, 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 the curriculum. The, the structure of the curriculum? Math, math curriculum. <laughs> Both. <laughs> I think, is it constructivism or TDS or both? Or more? What? Influenced by these, are you oh, saying yeah, is the curriculum the, influenced the curriculum by these that we theories? Have right now. Is that what you're asking? No. No. I'm formulating it. Okay. Is there another question while the well, our oh, lady is, uh, is um, rethinking what to, uh, how to ask her she, question? She's asking if you think it's possible to work with the constructivism and TDS with the curriculum of a math we have? Well, it depends which curriculum. Um, um, it depends which curriculum. What I do know is that uh, in North America, at least in, in Canada in particular, the curriculum is, has been very, very, very influenced by uh, the constructivism much less by that uh, theory of uh, the didactical situations, of course. But, uh, uh, yeah, there is a, um, a great influence of constructivism in North America. Yeah. Okay. okay. May I? Uh, I want to ask about uh, how in this evolution, uh, how is changing in front of the class with the teachers, I don't. Uh, wh how is changing the classes of mathematics in the elementary school, for instance? And uh, uh, now the teachers are using the uh, sociocultural perspective, or before they use the. Uh, 
well, yeah, I think it, it, that changes from country to country, and even perhaps even within us, the same country, it, it may change. But uh, certainly there is a, and, and, and actually this is a, an, an interesting point. One of the, the things that also characterize the third moment in the evolution of mathematics education is the, 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 the need uh, uh, to rethink the teacher. Yeah. In the first moment, it was the mathematical content. In the second moment, it was the student, the learner. In the third moment, there has been a, 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 a profound uh, effort to, to try to rethink the teacher. Yeah. Although not necessarily the teacher is being uh, reconsidered, uh, reconceptualized, perhaps in the best terms. Yeah, but uh, there, there is a lot of, um, uh, of reflection about uh, the, the, the role of the teacher, yeah. But still, not perhaps as much as we would like to have in terms of the, this idea of working together with, with the students. You, I think we still are living the, the, under the traces of the second moment and the, the, the autonomy project. Sometimes this is not ex explicitly expressed, but it is there in the practice. Thank you. And our last question. Okay. Here. Uh, in the beginning of, the, of your talk, you said that the, the teacher may pay attention to the student's needs and interests. interests. Mm. And after knowing the student's needs and interests, what should the teacher do? Should he focus on the student's need or on the student's interest? Yeah. At, at, in the second moment of, uh, of uh, the evolution of mathematics education, I think that that was the idea. The, the, the idea was precisely in, in the frame of uh, the, the child-centered pedagogy to, to start from the child. Yeah. This is not what we are saying. Uh, we, because there is a different conception of the child. We don't think that the child comes into the world with already a, a, a project of life. The interests and, uh, and uh, motivations will, uh, will be formed as the child develops, as the child grows. So to pose the problem in terms of, of, of the interest of the student is to, to still to remain in the traps of the second movement, in the, in the, in the traps of individualism, and to see in the, 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 the student as the origin of knowledge. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now please join me in thanking Lewis again for a superb lecture, and we will start again at 2.45 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.